Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Whenever we leave our kids with a babysitter, we're going to give that babysitter a list of things to know and remember while we're gone. I'm sure if you have kids, you've done the same thing. Well, today as we turn to John 14, we're going to see that Jesus is giving his disciples a list of truths they need to know while he's gone. So welcome to our next episode in our study of the key chapters of God's Word. Today we are turning to John chapter 14. Now, as we turn to John 14, this chapter deals with the question of what do we do now? Let's just step back before we get to John 14 and remember where we are in John's gospel and ultimately what this gospel is saying about the entire prophetic plan of God. Remember, the prophetic plan of God is that that, that God is fixing the problem of our sin and rebellion. Our whole world is under God's judgment for our sin and for our rebellion. But going back all the way to Genesis 3.15, God told Adam and Eve that he would be the one who would fix the problem. In Genesis 12, God told Abraham that through him all the nations would be blessed. And it was specifically through his seed that we know, of course, to be Jesus. And so the Old Testament has just been unfolding these grand promises and prophecies about this coming Savior. We have learned that he's going to be a king. He's going to be a Messiah. We have learned that he's going to atone for the sins of his people himself. He'll give himself to atone for their sins. And there's all these great messianic expectations and all these messianic prophecies. And yet in the midst of them, there's one prophecy we must remember, and that's Daniel 9.26. If you remember from our podcast in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel 9.26 tells us that the Messiah will be cut off. And so in Jesus' day, many people were looking forward to the Messiah coming. They were kind of forgetting about Daniel 9.26, but that is a prophecy that must be fulfilled. And so Jesus comes on the scene. He establishes the fact that he is the Messiah, that he's fulfilled these messianic prophecies. But again, there's still this prophecy of the Messiah being cut off. Jesus knows that that prophecy is about to be fulfilled over the next 24 hours. He's going to be arrested and tried, crucified and buried. And so now as we come to John chapter 14, we are in the midst of this long episode, what we call the Last Supper that began back in John 13. And in John 13, Jesus and his disciples meet together in the upper room for this Passover meal, this Passover Seder. In chapter 13, he washes the disciples' feet. He gives them the command to love one another. And then at the end of chapter 13, he tells them he's leaving. And that brings us to chapter 14. If Jesus leaves, if the Messiah King leaves, well, what are we supposed to do now? And chapter 14 gives us the answer. So now as we look at chapter 14, verses 1 to 3 give us this familiar passage that's often discussed at funerals and memorial services. In verse 1, Jesus says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. You see, Jesus wants his disciples to know and believe and trust and rely upon the truth that he is the prophesied Messiah and that although he is departing, this is good. This is all going according to God's plan. It's for their good. They should not be troubled by this. And so in verse 2, they need to know that Jesus is going to prepare a place for them. He has a specific place in mind for each of them. He'll prepare it for them and he'll prepare them for it. And in verse 3, he'll return for them and bring them back to him. In other words, yes, Jesus is going to be cut off, but he's not going to be defeated. And although they're entering this period where Jesus will not be with them, God's plan is still moving forward and God's kingdom is still expanding. And one day, Jesus will return to establish his kingdom. Now, This news is just discouraging and confusing to the disciples. And so they say in verse 5, Thomas says specifically, basically, we don't know where you're going, Lord, and we don't know how to get there. Jesus then answers Thomas with one of my favorite verses in the Bible. He says in John 14, 6, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus is the only way. No one comes to the Father but through him. If we want to be saved, if we want to be rescued from this world, if we want to be with the Father for all eternity, it must be, can only be through Jesus. Why? Because he alone has paid the penalty for our sins. He alone has come from heaven to us. He alone has gone back to heaven. He alone will come back from heaven for us. He is the author of life. He is the author of truth. He is the only way that we can know true truth. He is the only way we can be saved. Now, notice those two words in verse 6 where he says, I am. 
We haven't mentioned this yet in our study of John's gospel, but this is very specific wording. It's used in this specific way seven times in John's gospel. And we've actually been kind of seeing these already, just not really pausing to talk about them. But several times Jesus says, I am and something. For instance, he says in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life, or I am the light of the world in John 8, 12, or I am the door in John 10, 9. I am the good shepherd in John 10, 11. I am the resurrection and the life in John 11, 25, and 26. Here we're seeing he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And tomorrow in John 15, 5, we're going to see that Jesus says, I am the vine. Now, what's up with this? Well, every time Jesus uses this phrase, I am, he is using a specific term that the Lord Yahweh used of himself all the way back in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, when God said to Moses, I am who I am. You see, the Hebrew word Yahweh is the Hebrew way of saying I am. It occurs essentially on every page of scripture and and is the holy name of the Lord. And because Yahweh calls himself I am, these seven I am statements in John's gospel links Jesus to Yahweh and shows them that Yahweh is in their midst. Now, up to this point in John's gospel, it seems as though the disciples weren't picking up this point. And so in verse 7, Jesus says to them that if they know Jesus, they know the Father. Now, Philip doesn't understand this, and so he says, Lord, show us the Father, and that'll be enough. And at this, Jesus makes this astounding statement. He says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. That's the point Jesus is making all along with all these I am statements. He has been revealing the Father to them. And so going on in John 14, in verses 10 to 12, Jesus reminding them, he's just wanting them to see, look at what I've done. Isn't that the work of the Father among you? And so he asked them to reflect upon these miracles and see basically that the only way they could be done, the only way they could change molecules of time and space and stop wind and waves and, and make fish and bread out of nothing, that's all requiring God to work, the Father to work. And he would not work in a person who was not speaking his message. And if they understood what Jesus has been doing this whole time, they would understand that in Jesus, they have been seeing the Father all along. And so God has been working among them all this time. And then in verses 13 and 14, Jesus lets them know that in his departure, he will not leave them. He will still be a part of the work they're doing. And so he says to them, if they ask anything in his name, he will do it. Now, let's just pause for a moment and just stop and just, what does Jesus mean by ending our prayers in Jesus' name? Often we end our prayers and we just kind of say, in Jesus' name, amen. Is that what Jesus is getting at here? Well, not really. When we are praying in Jesus' name, we are praying for Christ, for his kingdom, for his kingdom work. We're seeking his glory. And so Jesus is saying here that when you're aligning with me, when you're submitting to me, when you're seeking my glory, seeking to do my kingdom work in this world, when you are seeking me, I'll be working too. And so we have this encouragement that when our lives are about Christ and his kingdom work, he'll be working in our lives and we'll see him working and just this incredible blessing to be a part of the work of Christ. But it's not a blanket promise that whatever we ask for, as long as we end saying, in Jesus' name, amen, that we're sure to have it. Jesus is not saying that. He is saying when you're part of my work, when you're seeking my glory, when you're seeking my name, you will see me working in your life. Not only that, but in verse 12, he promises to not only keep on working with them, but, but they will see him do greater works through them than even he has done. Now, again, what does that mean? Does that mean they're going to be feeding not like 5,000 people, but like 15,000 people or, or calming super huge storms on the Mediterranean Sea, not just the Sea of Galilee? No. What this is saying is that in terms of greater, is in terms of relative, relative importance, it's one thing just to calm storms or, or feed people. It is vastly more infinite in worth and value to be bringing the message of the kingdom around this world and to have the Holy Spirit working through us so that people will be seeing and hearing the message and believing in Christ and entering into an eternal relationship with him that will, that will matter forever. That is infinitely greater. And when we're in heaven, when we're in glory, we're not going to be sitting around saying, hey, so how many people do you feed? We're going to be, be celebrating the work of Christ in us and through us as he was reconciling people to himself through our message. That is the message that's most important. And that's the work that's greater in eternal worth than even miracles of like feeding people. And now, perhaps the disciples were struggling with this point. And so he tells them that if they love him, they will obey him. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. He reiterates the same point down in verse 21 saying, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father 
and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. In other words, citizens of Christ's kingdom will do whatever their king commands and they will be about the work of the kingdom. Now again, we might ask this question, how? After all, we're not God. We have finite human limitations. How do we do all of this? Well, Jesus then answers that question in the next statement of verse 16. He says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. In verse 17, Jesus calls this helper the spirit of truth. And down in verse 26, he calls him the Holy Spirit. And so with Jesus physically leaving them, the Holy Spirit will now be the one who spiritually indwells them. In verse 16, he will abide with us forever. You see, the Holy Spirit's presence in our life is tantamount to the triune God's presence in our life. That's why Jesus says in verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Or in verse 20, in that day you will know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. When he dwells within us, it is the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. So let's take a moment to discuss who is this Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. The Trinity is the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. But we should be careful. We should not think that, that somehow it's like Yahweh is the Father and Jesus is the Son and the Holy Spirit is just some kind of force in this world. That's not how it is. The term Yahweh refers to the triune God who's made up of three persons, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, who are all God. And yet this distinction between the Godhead, as we sometimes call it, is the distinction of the Trinity. And so you see in verse 16, Jesus, who is one person, asked the Father, who is another person, to send the Holy Spirit, who is a third person. You have these three people of the Trinity mentioned throughout the Bible, going back all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, where you have God the Father, you have God the Spirit, you have the Logos, the Word, the voice of God being spoken of there, or like in Isaiah 48, 16 or 42, 1. Throughout the Bible, we see God is triune, never for, always just triune. And here we see that it's Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And yet they are different, which is why Jesus, for instance, can say in verse 28 that the Father is greater. What does that mean? Well, it means that Jesus is right now talking to his disciples at dinner time, and he's still in his subordinated human state. Paul describes this condition in Philippians 2, 7, when Christ emptied himself and took the form of a man, became his servant. He was in this humbled condition for a while, but then with his ascension, he returns back to his former glory. And yet in all of this, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are equal in essence, yet different in function. And so you see Jesus calling the Holy Spirit our helper in verse 16. In verse 26, he is our teacher who teaches us the spiritual truth we apprehend. They have different functions and they have different roles, and yet together they are who we call God or who we call Yahweh. Well, going back to this passage here, as we finish out chapter 14, Jesus wants to assure the disciples that everything that is about to transpire is going according to God's plan. And so he wants them to have peace. And so he says to them in verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. And so Jesus wants his disciples to have peace, knowing that as these events unfold, as they wait for his return, all of this is going according to God's design. So what is this peace? How do we have this? This is just that settled trust in God, that, that sense and awareness that God is working, he's got our situation under control, that everything is going according to his plan. Where does this peace come from? Well, peace comes from God as he transforms our belief, our faith, to trust him and to trust his word and to live our lives in light of it. You see, if we do not believe Christ or trust him or seek to keep his commandments or really live for his purposes or submit to his spirit, we're not going to find we have peace. His peace comes from doing these things. If we do them, if we do trust him, if we do obey his commandments, if we do live for him and his glory, his kingdom work, if we are filled with his spirit, we will have his peace. Paul described this peace in Philippians 4, 7 as peace that passes understanding or peace that just is beyond all comprehension. It just when we go through life's difficulties, we'll have God's abiding, settled peace when we're walking with him. And yet, Jesus also says in verse 30, as this chapter is just coming to a close, he says, the rule of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. 
The ruler of this world is coming. This is Satan. We need to be on guard against him because he will be seeking to take our our thoughts, our focus, and, and focus it on pretty much anything besides Jesus. And when his influence or the world's influence is winning in our life in that way so that we're focused on anything but Jesus or all kinds of things and just kind of getting distracted from our main goal, we're going to find that the the power and the peace of the Holy Spirit in our life just begins to ebb a little bit, it begins to kind of leave us a little bit, just because we're not walking according to our kingdom purposes. Well, that's John 14. Thanks for listening to this podcast. It's always so great to go through God's Word together with you. I look forward to catching up with you tomorrow as we go to John 15, another great key chapter. And until then, have a great day, and God bless.